very warm welcome to New York and this edition of On the Record uh, as we look at a, a series that has been uh, ongoing here at the UN over the past two days known as the Africa Dialogue Series. The theme of this year's uh, series is the year of refugees, returnees and internally displaced persons towards durable solutions for forced displacement in Africa. It is a combined event hosted by the Office of the Special advisor on Africa. Essentially that is the leading secretariat office as it pertains to issues on Africa and the African Union. Let's listen now to some of the views and positions of some of the important stakeholders that have been participating in the series. We have what we could be called a solidarity deficit multilateral decision-making processes, policies and programs that should be skewed, uh, skewed towards the needs, views and priorities of Africa are not quite there yet. This is evident in our prevailing approach to those who have been forcibly displaced by violence, emergencies and disasters. The vast majority, over 80%, are hosted by developing countries, one-third in Africa. Many rich countries, meanwhile, have been reluctant to accept significant numbers. With refugees and displaced people is to prevent them from having to leave their homes. That means tackling root causes, poverty, conflict, discrimination and exclusion of all kinds. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the African Union's Agenda 2063 are our roadmap. Both agendas are aligned around the people-centered and planet-sensitive transformation. Eradicating poverty is their overriding priority. We are working closely together to mainstream these agendas into national development plans and to operationalize the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration to help countries reap the benefits of migration while securing the rights of migrants. As more and more people cross an increasing numbers of interstate borders and maritime zones in search of security, jobs, and a better future, the need to confront, assimilate, or expel foreigners strains political systems and collective identities. But in Africa, warmly welcoming people from other shores and lands, even with limited means, has always been a key characteristic of African genuine humanity and compassion. Our Ubuntu. So to discuss further the issue of refugees, forced displacement and other issues uh, pertaining to Africa as we move closer to May 25th, which is of course Africa Day, I, I am now joined by the CEO of the African Union's Development Agency, NEPAD, uh, no stranger to these parts of the world, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Mayaki. Dr. Mayaki, warm welcome back to the United Nations, good to see you. Thank you for inviting me. So I want to start with a housekeeping issue, right? You've been bold as among the keynote speakers at, at this Africa Dialogue series. I attended a media roundtable this morning and your absence was noticed. Is there an issue? Is our perception correct that there is some sort of issue between the uh, AU Development Agency, NEPAD, and the Office of the Special Advisor on Africa? And if not, correct me so. What's going on? Absolutely not. It's just a a question of miscommunication and uh, conflicting agendas. But I can reassure you, if you want to be reassured, <laughs> that uh, uh, the Office of a Special Advisor for Africa is held in high esteem by the African Union. Uh, as you know, there is an, a memorandum of understanding between the African Union and the United Nations. And in the implementation of this MOU, the Office of a Special Advisor has a critical role to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, our interaction with this office is uh, opportune, beneficial, positive. There is absolutely no problem. But you haven't been showing up to some of their events. Why is that? Well, because I had commitments also with ECOSOC on a very critical issue, which was uh, the regional settings. That's as the you Economic know, and Social Council. The UN development system is going through a reform. Uh, there is a segment of that reform which has to, to do with the regional architecture of the UN. And Africa has a particular interest in making sure 
but uh, what we are aiming at mm -hmm. is reflected in this reform. So fundamentally it was a, a, an issue of uh, conflicting agendas and the head of uh, Office of a Special Advisor for Africa knows that perfectly well. And no doubt a discussion between the two of you will be able to sort this out uh, moving forward. Uh, Dr. Miyaki... There is nothing to sort out. Fair enough, fair okay. enough, but we'll, we'll, we'll still keep watching. Okay. Many at home are probably worrying about, uh, thinking about the metamorphosis that, the, that NEPAD has, has uh -huh. undergone, right? You're now called the African Union Development Agency. This was a decision taken by heads of state last yes. year, implemented, uh -huh. I think, by September last year. Uh -huh. What's changed? How does your role change now? You see, three things have changed fundamentally. Uh, first of all, we need to get the narrative right. And the origin of the narrative goes back to the reform of the African Union, which was delegated to President Kagame. Mm -hmm. In the reform of the African Union, several issues were flagged out. The issue of financing, you know, with a 0.2% levy on a list of imported goods, uh, the eligible uh, goods. Uh, in order to reduce our dependency from partners' funding, especially on the issues of peace and security. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, the rationalization of the working methods of the African Union. And thirdly, a better division of labor between the African Union Commission, the Regional Economic Commission, and what would be a continental development agency right and the role of that continental development agency would be to uh, centralize the implementation function and the role of the african union commission would be to uh, uh, define the strategic guidelines on issues of development peace and security and governance so uh, we are the product of a reform which aims at rationalizing the AU and providing a better division of labor. But NEPAD was maintained as a brand because, as you know, right. that brand has been a very positive one all along <laughs> these uh, it's, uh, years. It's just and not so uh, new anymore. That's the only problem with that brand. <laughs> yes, it's not so new, but uh, uh, things uh, that are not necessarily new but have been working positively can be maintained. So the decision okay. of the heads of states was to call it African Union Development Agency, IFAN NEPAD, and it's welcome. So they come up with the ideas, do the, do, do the member states, and you basically have to technically implement those ideas, correct? Exactly. In a nutshell. Exactly. So let's move to the discussion here at the Africa Dialogue series. Mm -hmm. The question of forced displacement, Dr. Miyaki, and finding durable solutions, I think, is key. Mm -hmm. There are 26 million people that are on the radar of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. So to put that into some, expect, uh, some perspective for our viewers back home, 68 million people globally are mm -hmm. displaced, 26 million in Africa, that's more than one third. Mm -hmm. What say you as the development agency of the continent about the durable solutions that can be applied to fixing this long-standing problem? Uh, I, I think the, the diagnosis uh, has been made. Uh, uh, the data has been gathered, the analytical frameworks have been uh, 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 constructed. Uh, what we need to go towards is really uh, about solutions. Mm -hmm. And the solutions can be classified in two main categories. Uh, the first category is about governance. Uh, we need to get governance right. What do I mean by getting governance right? It means that uh, uh, the economic opportunities uh, that are being laid out within the countries, uh, the access uh, to services, especially public services, uh, the, the capacity uh, to uh, be master of your own destiny, destiny. Right. Uh, the dignity that has mm. to go with all these issues, uh, these are governance issues. We tend to think about governance as an issue of institutions, but fundamentally governance is about the dignity of a common and ordinary citizen. Mm. That's the first category of solutions. And uh, these solutions are no longer the monopoly of governments alone. 
uh, it has to be a societal responsibility where governments uh, do interact with civil society, private sector, etc. But the second uh, category is really the right development strategies mm -hmm. in order uh, uh, to make sure that uh, these refugees, uh, uh, displaced persons, uh, are not the product of errors of strategies. I will give you an example. Mm -hmm. If you look at Boko Haram today yeah. in uh, northern Nigeria or southern Niger, which is my country, like Chad, and part of Chad and, yep. uh, and, uh, and Cameroon, fundamentally the reason why Boko Haram did develop was because we neglected in our planning systems the territorial dimension. So in neglected territories, uh, you had a void. Yeah. And well, it produced what it did produce. By reintroducing a territorial dimension in the way we plan our development, we can counter these effects. Mm. And this is extremely important. And, it, and it's, it's a lesson for most of the countries of the continent. Development is fundamentally local. Right. So uh, empowering local communities empowering local institutions, avoiding corruption to develop in municipalities, in local settings, is an absolute solution to the issue that we are referring so to. So quite a comprehensive uh, response there in terms of right, dealing with the root causes, mm -hmm. right? But we still have 26 uh, million Absolutely. In, uh, yeah, uh, yes. forcibly displaced people okay. today, refugees mm -hmm. that cross borders, whether for mm -hmm. conflict, climate change, mm -hmm. or as you say, uh, for in, in terms of uh, economic aspirations. Let's take South Africa as an example. Mm -hmm. Xenophobic attacks have been a kind of curse on the country, mm -hmm. the country's image in recent years, as, as recently as March of this year. Mm -hmm. Take South Africa as an example where there's an existing problem mm -hmm. of refugees, of people that have crossed borders mm -hmm. for better opportunities. What's the lack of understanding in certain communities in our country that targets these people unfairly so in terms of what the international agenda is? Well, xenophobia in South Africa uh, is an illustration of a, a societal behavior that has also happened in other African countries. So we should uh, uh, clearly state that it happened in Nigeria with Ghanaian some times back and uh, it has happened in other countries. So it's not so unique to South Africa? It, it's not unique to South Africa. What could uh, be characterized as unique to South Africa is that South Africa was emblematic in the liberation process of the continent. I remember when I was a student, I mean, my main priority politically and ideologically, and I wasn't alone, thousands, tens of thousands of African students had as a priority uh, uh, that uh, goal of liberating South Africa. So being an emblematic uh, uh, figure of the liberation right. process, right. so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit uh, uh, alarming to see uh, 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 this xenophobia do develop. But uh, we need to say that uh, there is a clear conscious in all the political spectrum of the necessity to combat xenophobia. Mm -hmm. And combating xenophobia is, for me, fundamentally a question of education. It has to go through, you know, civic education. And uh, civic education starts with uh, 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 mm -hmm. young children. And also and, uh, a better understanding, I mean, to speak to the issue of education, a better understanding of the economic benefits that refugees actually bring to a country rather yeah. than take out of that country. It's a good segue, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Miyaki, mm -hmm. to talking about the continental free trade area. Mm -hmm. uh, an agreement that the Economic Commission on Africa says will boost intra-Africa trade mm -hmm. by 52% yes. come 2020. Yes. What's oh. your understanding of when this agreement will go into force? I understand you have enough signatures. What's the delay? Uh, so. Four quick issues regarding the continental free trade area. First of all, uh, we have moved quite significantly uh, since the Abuja Treaty, and we are aiming at a common African market. Uh, the main obstacle to our development is fragmentation. Mm 
mm -hmm. the fact that we have 55 countries. Uh, uh, with fragmentation, you can't uh, uh, build on economies of scale and you can't have optimal solutions which are fundamentally at regional level. Uh, countries like uh, Togo, uh, Malawi, uh, Niger, uh, or Tanzania can't solve alone their energy problems. They need regional solutions, mm -hmm, first mm -hmm. of all. So fragmentation is a key issue uh, that impediment. Africa has to yeah, address. Exactly. Uh, Second secondly, uh, we need to be in strong regional markets. It's strong regional markets will uh, create the space where we will learn to be competitive and have a greater uh, place within global trade. So uh, building regional markets is, uh, is, is very important. Thirdly, once we go beyond regional markets and we connect regional markets, that's where we have a continental free trade area. Mm. But the fact that uh, the treaty has been ratified by a certain number of countries is the first step. Okay. We need to do our homework. And that homework has two main legs, a political leg where uh, you know, the elites need to push the agenda. The political world. And a, technic a technical leg where we need to improve movements of uh, people, movements of goods, uh, one-stop border post, uh, uh, solving logistics issues, uh, boosting uh, 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 the fact that um, if I'm an entrepreneur, in, uh, in Nigeria, uh, I could easily go uh, to Tanzania or to South Africa right. and not to face uh, uh, the impediments that we are facing So today. similar to a Schengen type agreement is, is where you believe the future is in terms of yeah. the free movement across borders, that the AU passport, that needs to happen. Absolutely. And you need to take into account a critical factor, which is uh, the demographic dividend. Uh, if we don't boost intra-Africa trade and accompany uh, the boosting of the intra-Africa trade levels that we have today by uh, manufacturing and industrialization processes, when we will get to be two billions mm. in the next 30 years, we might face a chaotic situation. So the continental free trade area is a political response and at the same time, a technical response. So I want to talk about, since we're on the issue of trade, right? Free mm -hmm. movement of people, free movement of services and goods. There's a long-term strategy here that you've clearly laid out for us. Mm -hmm. What do the uh, trade wars like the one we are seeing now between the United States and China mm -hmm. do to the trajectory which you are seeking in terms of Africa's development? What do you say to those two biggest economies in the world mm -hmm. that are now currently engaged in a trade spat? Uh, what's interesting in, in, in your question is that it remembers me, you know, my, my classes in economics. And, uh, not, not so long many, ago. Not so long ago. <laughs> many economics professors tell you that, you know, trade is war, is a kind of war under another form. Because uh, you have competition, uh, you have some kind of protection, and you are pursuing fundamentally your interests. And you use all the means that can allow you to get to where you want to be. So uh, behind these trade wars, uh, you have a fundamental geopolitical issue uh, which is uh, linked to uh, changes in terms of power relationships. As you know, when we look at uh, uh, the emergence of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and the new technologies, uh, there is an underground war which is going on, uh, which is not um, fully perceived. You're right, but you're which is right. a, yeah. a, an important segment of the trade wars that we are uh, actually uh, 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 looking at. Just ask Huawei, right? Exactly. Right. So, the, uh, regarding Africa, uh, our interest is to make sure, first of all, that uh, we have a common market, uh, that uh, we learn to be competitive within this common market, but we can create the necessary skills. Uh, 400 million young Africans will need to have skills in the next 30, 40 years. So we have a, 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 an industrialization strategy which is adapted to our conditions, but without forgetting 
but we need to leapfrog and jump into a fourth industrial revolution. So putting this puzzle together mm. needs a united Africa. Let me jump to another issue. You wrote mm. this week, uh, Dr. Miyaki, an, a t uh, an article titled Putting Africa's Secondary Cities First which came on the back of a quality of living city ranking mm -hmm. that placed Africa's top city, Port Louis, Mauritius, at number 83 mm -hmm. out of uh, 231 cities. Durban is at 88, that's the best ranked South African city. Mm -hmm. Cape Town, 95. Johannesburg at 96. What's the critical message? What's the takeaway from that ranking? What does Africa need to do? There are three takeaways. The first one is our rate of urbanization is very strong, but we shouldn't focus only on uh, the rate of urbanization because many of our urbanized uh, areas are uh, somehow uh, ruralized urban settings. So uh, that's the first point. The second point is that the boundaries between urban and rural are, are shifting. They are not as clear as before. Sure. So there are uh, a, a sizable number of secondary cities where we need to uh, think in terms of development strategies. So we, we cannot rely only on trying to tackle the challenges that we face in the big cities. In the Johannesburg. Jobbers, yeah, right. the, the have Lagos to think about East so London and yeah. Port Elizabeth. We then. need to really focus on secondary cities. And uh, my bet is and not only mine, but uh, the OECD has produced a, 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 a document which is called Africa Police, which looks at the urbanization throughout uh, the, the continent. We need to look at secondary cities as drivers of development. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, spaces where jobs will be created. So get out of the Johannesburg bubble and let's look at uh, mm -hmm. some of the smaller cities. Let's just stay on South Africa, if, mm -hmm. if we will. Uh, country just went to the polls. President Ramaphosa was formally elected by parliament yesterday. His inauguration is on Saturday. But amidst all of that, there have been issues of corruption, um, energy crisis in South Africa, and, and, and that is ongoing. From a developmental point of view and what you're trying to achieve on the con continent, what does the South African example today teach us about how we need to move into the future? It's, it's, a, it's a profound question. But I, I try to be, it, I try uh, to be. It's a profound <laughs> question. I think South Africa, um, as all the elements that are needed uh, to launch uh, its trajectory in terms of uh, development. There is an economics professor called Ricardo Osman who is at Harvard, who is a friend of mine. I like him a lot. And he, 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 he says development is, uh, is a game where you have elements that you need to, be, to put together like in a scrabble. So you, you have letters that are given to you, and with these letters you do a word. So you, you don't have all the letters, <laughs> but the letters you have, you need to work with them. And South Africa has a really good set of letters. So South Africa has all the conditions right. to really... Uh, the elements uh, uh, for prosperity exist. Uh, absolutely. And You're saying how to put the word together, Exactly. Right? Yeah. And uh, I think... Well, it's, it has been already said within South Africa's National Development Plan. And I think the review of the National Development Plan will reinforce certain priorities and also uh, look at new priorities. And in uh, uh, these uh, new priorities, uh, I think there needs to be flagged out fundamentally uh, uh, the question of governance, evidently. Uh, the question of uh, uh, skills, which has been talked about a sure, lot, sure. but uh, which has to be taken much more seriously in a systematic manner, in a systemic manner, and this is what is starting to, 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 to be done. And thirdly, uh, you see, you have a very strong banking system, you have a strong financial sector. This banking system and this financial sector should be fundamentally pro-development. Uh, 
I'm not sure if it has been so pro-development up to now. But it, it's important that uh, 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 the resources that do exist mm -hmm. allow reduction of inequalities and uh, creation of, uh, of jobs. Let me ask you another profound uh, question on that very issue. What is the, how does the rest of the continent mm -hmm. view South Africa? Uh, I, there are two manners in which South Africa is, is, is viewed. Uh, first of all, it's viewed as a potential leader uh, which hasn't yet taken fully uh, conscious of what it can do. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it will happen. So it needs I'm to punch sure. above its weight. Is yeah, what you're uh, not to punch above its weight, but to punch uh, with the uh, instruments and the capacities that it has, and it is feasible. Uh, secondly, uh, it has to be much more open uh, to uh, the realities of a continent, mm -hmm. and uh, that goes also through you know education. Uh, um, uh, education in the global sense of the term. And uh, uh, thirdly, uh, I think South Africans should travel much more within the continent. And uh, each South African who travels in the continent loves more Africa, you see. Uh, and there is something which strikes me very much in in, 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 uh, in, in South Africa. It's sometimes you, you, you talk about South Africa as uh, the, uh, the Americans talk about the U.S., you see. Um, it, you know, there is a World Series of Baseball. Yes. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a national it's a US, it's, it's a, a national, national series. Yeah, so, series yeah. um, and frequently in South Africa, you know, there is that labeling of, of this is an African, uh, and it's, it's particularly South African. So the, the, the elements are there, really, sure. to allow South Africa to, uh, to open itself to the continent. And the continent needs a strong South Africa. So let me ask you a final question, Dr. Miyaki. Uh, not about South Africa, not about the continent, about you. You uh, were appointed CEO of NEPAD, I think, in February of 2009. That's uh, over... Yeah, March, but... It's, March, it's, close yeah. enough, right? Well, close enough. So, 10 years ago, give uh -huh. or take, what's your future? How long are you still going to stay in this job? Uh, are, are there any hints that you'll be retiring soon? Uh, I'm retiring next year. Uh, you know, I was supposed to retire two years ago, and I was requested to stay in order to facilitate that transformation into the African Union Development Agency. And uh, I'm glad that we have reached that point, but I'm retiring uh, next year. And all my energy will be uh, focused on making sure that this agency becomes a true continental development agency. So in a nutshell, there'll be a vacancy at the uh, African Union Development Absolutely. Agency. Absolutely. And you are called to compete for it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Miyaki, good to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much indeed. Thank you. Dr. Ibrahim Miyaki is the CEO of the now rebranded African Union Development Agency slash NEPAD, but as I said, not so new anymore. This has been a live edition of the Roundup live here from the United Nations in New York. Thank you for watching.